I'm on a mission to put forest protection at the forefront of our national climate conversation in the US. But before I get there, I want to tell you about this photograph. This picture represents the story of my life. This is a simple black and white photograph, but it's one of my most prized possessions. It's a picture of me with my parents walking down a dirt road in the middle of a forest off the island of Defusky, just off the coast of South Carolina, across the river from where I grew up. I was fortunate enough to be raised as a free-range wild child uh, in the low country of South Carolina. And uh, when I look at this picture, I remember a time when I was so connected to nature. We lived by the rhythms of the tides. I remember climbing in the big live oak trees with the moss hanging down. I remember hours of building forts with my sister of the palm, from the palm fronds of the palmetto trees. And I remember running through the tall pine trees um, and finding all kinds of treasures on the forest floor like bones and feathers and even arrowheads. Uh, when I look at this picture, my life makes sense. Hundreds of stories of time spent in the woods that shape my life. And for the last 20 years, I've dedicated my adult career to protecting the forests of the southeastern U.S. To this day, I still play and run in the forest. And as an adult, I've grown to appreciate the forest as a place where I can escape the digital, industrial, and technological world that has dominated human society for the last 100 years. I know that I'm not alone in terms of my relationship to the forest. I was re reminded of this just in July when I was at a for forest uh, storytelling event in Durham where a dozen or so people got up on stage and told their own personal stories about forests. And these were people of very different professions, religions, races, all kinds of backgrounds. But the one thing that really stuck with me was the fact that story after story was about how forests had inspired people at a time of despair where it provided them hope at a time when they needed it most in their life, or helped them to overcome some challenges, some of them very small, but some of them actually quite large. And I know each of you in the room today probably has your own story to tell about how forests have inspired you in some way. We live in one of the most challenging moments in the history of humanity. We are facing one of the biggest challenges we've ever faced. Climate change is real. Humans are causing it, and if we do not do a course correct in a very short period of time, we are on a sure path to extinction. Now, forest protection around the world is starting to be seen as a major priority, especially for those uh, countries in the tropics that have been living a little bit closer to nature than we have for the last couple of hundred years. Um, but in the U.S., forest protection is barely a blip on the climate radar. But there is some good news about climate change. There is an unprecedented effort right now happening globally. People all over the world are coming together behind a single goal to keep temperatures from increasing 1.5 degrees over the, by the end of this century. And that's a, incredible that we have this kind of international cooperation that's happening right now to solve this problem. It's also encouraging to me that scientists have pretty much figured out what it is we need to do to solve this problem. And we need to do two things. One is we need to stop putting so much carbon into the atmosphere. And this is a story that we've been told a lot in the U.S., and we're getting it. We've got to get off fossil fuels, and we've got to move to clean, renewable energy like solar and wind power. But the story that's not being told is that that is not going to be enough. And that's because there's a second thing that we have to do now uh, to solve the climate crisis. And that is that we actually have to start reducing the amount of carbon that is in the atmosphere. Because once we emit carbon, it can hang around in the atmosphere for hundreds, thousands of years. And scientists have recorded this year that the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is now at 410 parts per million. The last time that the Earth had 410 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, humans did not exist. And climate scientists have pretty much consensed that the safe level of carbon for humans in the atmosphere is 350 parts per million. So we're at 410, 
We have to get to 350. How are we going to get there? Forests. That's how we're going to get there. We will not solve the climate crisis without forests. Now, there's two options that we have for how we could use forests as a solution to climate change that are being proposed right now. And let me just propose these here for you all, and let's decide together what makes the most sense. The first option looks like this, and it's a big factory, and it's an industrial process where we take trees, we burn them to generate electricity in place of coal, and then we trap the carbon and we store it underground. And the idea there is because trees suck carbon out of the atmosphere, that we suck that carbon, it's stored, then it gets burned, and we capture it. Suck it, capture it, repeat, and we're sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. The problem with this technology is it is incredibly expensive. It's going to cost trillions of dollars. It has not been tested. We do not know whether it will work or not. And even if it does work, we don't know that it will work on the scale needed to affect the global atmosphere. On the other hand, oh, the other thing that this will require is massive amounts of trees, which means that we would have to grow trees in rows as crops and have an industrialized landscape in order to, to make this work. Option number two, we protect our natural forests. Too often we humans are looking to technology to solve all our problems. And while technology certainly can solve some of our problems, we do not look to nature enough for answers. Forests represent our best technology for removing and storing carbon from the atmosphere. They've been doing it for 300 million years. And in fact, the reason why humans were even able to evolve onto the land of this earth is because of the role that forests played in helping to stabilize the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, creating just the right conditions for humans to be able to survive. This is our best technology, and we know it works, and we know it can work at a global scale. And in addition, if we protect our natural forests and restore our natural forests, we also get a lot of bonus material. We get added flood control, natural flood control. We get added water stabilization and purification. We get natural air conditioning, things that are really going to matter in the 21st century as we start to experience a changing climate. And in addition, we get cool creatures like owls and snakes and bears and birds. And these creatures' lives are also now integrally tied to the decisions that we humans are going to make about what choice we're going to take, choice number one or choice number two. So I imagine everybody in this audience is probably thinking option number two. <laughs> Why not option number two? Well, I think the thing that we have to realize is that the scale up of forest protection is a really big idea. right? We as humans for the last couple of hundred years have not been doing a very good job of protecting much of the Earth's forests. So this requires us to really rethink a lot of things. It requires us to shift the way that we value what's important. And we have to start recognizing the value of nature. Now, I'm about to tell you some stories about forest destruction in our own backyard that are not being told right now. Because while in the tropics, they're scaling up forest protection as a climate solution, we haven't quite yet gotten it yet in the U.S. that we have a huge problem in our own backyard. In 2014, scientists produced for the first time global maps of forest cover loss around the world using satellite imagery data. The dark purple represents those areas that are highest rates of forest cover loss. And you can see that the United States has a lot of dark purple. And in particular, in the United States, you can see that the dark purple is in the southeastern coastal plain of the US. Forest disturbance from logging in the southeastern region is four times that of South American rainforest. Why are we not talking about forest protection as a critical climate issue in the US? We're the world's largest producer and consumer of wood products. Logging causes carbon stored to be released. And so while we're logging our forests, we're also helping to contribute carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Our government isn't reporting these emissions right now. But scientists who are studying this and who have calculated the amount of emissions coming from logging are, are showing that the emissions are staggering and that this problem is way bigger than we realize right now. 
And a lot of times we've been told the story that our forests grow back. We have a lot of forests across the landscape. Look at all the trees. Well, what we're not being told is that it takes over 100 years for a forest to recover once it's been logged in terms of just the carbon that we've lost, the benefit, the climate benefit that we've lost when we've logged our forest. We also haven't been taught in history the history of our country's forests and what has happened to our forests over the course of the last couple of hundred years. And you can see from these maps, in 1620, we had vast acres of old growth, intact forest landscapes. By 1850, which is around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you can see from 1850 to 1926 and then to 1990, we had lost pretty much all of our intact old growth forested landscapes across the US. This was our Earth's original climate stabilization system. And over the course of the last couple of hundred years, as a part of the Industrial Revolution, we've not only been putting too much carbon from fossil fuels into the atmosphere, but we've been pumping carbon into the atmosphere that was otherwise stored in our forests. And we've degraded our climate stabilization system. So why do old forests matter so much? This graph shows this very clearly. It's a simple bar graph. It shows on the right a forest that's 60 years old. On the left is an old growth forest, and that represents how much carbon is stored in a young forest versus an old forest. So we can see by this graph that if we were to grow forests old again, we could suck out a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. And this is especially true for us in the US because across our country, though trees can live to be hundreds, even some over a thousand years old, less than 15% of our forests across the country are older than 100 years. And in the southeastern coastal plain, less than 5% of our forests are over 100 years old. So by growing forests old again, protecting our natural forests, we can suck a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere, and our forests have a critical role to play. We also hear a lot that we replant. We're really good at replanting forests in the southeastern U.S. and in the U.S. as a whole. But the, what they mean when they say we're replanting five for every tree that we cut down is this, an industrial tree plantation that's treated like a crop, sprayed with herbicides and fertilizers. We're very good at growing forests for wood products. We're not good at growing forests for things like flood control and carbon storage and water stabilization and wildlife and biodiversity. This is exactly what they mean when they say replant a forest. So we've got a landscape that looks like this. This is a picture, a bird's eye view of a degraded climate stabilization system and a degraded flood control system of patchwork of clear cuts and tree farms and young forests. And the cost of this forest degradation is huge, and it impacts the most vulnerable among us, the poorest in our community, and that, let's just face it, typically means people of color in the southeastern US are bearing the brunt of the impacts of this. Our forests could be providing significant flood control at a time when we need it the most, but with a rate and scale of logging that's four times that of South American rainforest, we're not getting the optimum protection for these communities that we, do, that we need. I wish I could say that we are moving in the right direction and that we're starting to embrace forest protection in the U.S. as a critical climate solution, but unfortunately, we're moving backwards. We're moving in the direction of option number one. We are, the southeastern U.S. has just become the world's largest wood pellet manufacturer where they're being exported to Europe and burned in power stations to generate electricity in place of coal as renewable energy. This photograph shows a map of the green dots being the existing facilities, the yellow dots being those that are planned or proposed. I'm very encouraged and inspired by these two women right here. They're in our backyard in a little town in Richmond County, North Carolina. They're two African-American women who are mobilizing their community and saying enough is enough. They're mobilizing their community to stop the world's largest wood pellet manufacturer from building another wood pellet mill in North Carolina. And they need our support and our help. They are saying, standing up and saying no. And people are starting to support this effort. And we have an opportunity right now to actually return the tide on the wood pellet industry in North Carolina. But forest protection needs to become a part 
of our discussion at a national level about climate change. I'm very encouraged by the campaigns that have been run that where we have uh, targeted on the problem of coal burning and we've actually started to transition to solar and wind power. And it's because of people speaking up, standing up. It's because of public pressure. Let's, not, let's just be very clear about this. It's because of public pressure that we are moving away from coal and starting to move towards solar and wind power. We can do the same for our forests, but it requires every single one of us in this room to stand up and make their voices heard. This is an all hands on deck moment, and we can no longer sit back and expect that one person or some kind of technology is gonna solve this problem. This is a problem that only we, as humans, can coming together can solve, and we need you to plug in and join this movement Click onto this website and you can join the movement. And we need you to contact your governors and your local elected officials, your members of Congress, and let them know that we need them to start investing in forest protection and restoring our natural flood control system and restoring our forest ability to do its job in helping to protect us against the worst effects of climate change. And the end of the day, we have something so beautiful if we make this turn as humanity. I believe that if we just listen to the story that the forest is telling us right now about our relationship, human relationship with the forest, it would go something like this. You humans have lived in harmony with us forests for thousands of years. And it's really only been in the last couple of hundred years that you have separated yourself from our relationship. You have treated us with such disrespect that it's almost on the point of abuse. And we can help you solve this problem, but not if you keep abusing us. If you let us grow old and wild again, we can ensure that humans can continue to thrive on this planet into the next century. And we can ensure that generations to come can find their own inspiring stories in the forest. Thank you.